Hi, I'm Adrian Bell. We have so much to show you on this week's Bonnets and Hoods, but the best part about today's show is we're going to go through a fabulous road club called Roadmates, a car club that specializes in street rods and hot rodding, and we're going to meet a guy who specializes in it and some of the club members as well. Stay with us. It's a snowy morning and a Colorado state trooper is off to investigate another accident on the busy interstate, the equivalent of our motorway. It seems that when it comes to matching the style of driving to the weather conditions, the Americans are just as bad as we are. I'm going to be northbound Colorado 25, about the 167. I got a Ford Expedition down there that I guess hit something and the airbags deployed, unknown of injury. Well, what we're going to do, first of all, is get down there safely. As you can see, the road conditions are miserable. So we're going to get down there safely, and then from that point, I'll interview the drivers, any witnesses, uh, try and figure out and put the clues together of what happened. And once I determine what happens, at that time, I'll decide if I should issue a citation to the, the at-fault vehicle. Uh, and since this is only a one-vehicle accident, I can already tell you, just from experience of working this kind of road condition, um, and being in a utility like the Expedition, they were driving too fastly for road conditions and he lost control, spun out and crashed. Uh, here in the States, the way we should do it is for every 10 miles an hour that the speed limit is, you should be one car length behind. So on our freeways and our interstates, speed limits are 55, 65. You should be, you know, for 55 miles an hour, you should be five to six car lengths behind. We get a lot of people out here that follow less than one car length. And with our traffic through the metro area here in Denver, the traffic comes to a standstill. Um, instantly. It can happen that fast during rush hours. But when you're following less than a car link, less than two car links, you don't have time to stop. You rear end them. Um, and that's the biggest problem we're trying to attack right now and trying to educate the motoring public to back off and give that following distance so if traffic does come to a quick stop, you have plenty of time to stop without rear ending somebody. The sorry state of a crashed Ford Explorer has unfortunately been a common one in the States recently with a spate of serious tyre blowouts. But this time, it looks like this is just the result of driving too fast for the conditions. Okay, tell me what happened real quick. Um, my daughter and I were on our way to Denver and we hit a patch of ice and just slid across. We hit the main the guardrail and spun around and slid right over there. Okay, but how fast were you going today? Uh, I don't think I was going any faster than 60. I know I was taking the train traffic. Okay, well, I'm going to go ahead and grab some paperwork for you to fill on what happened, and then I'll investigate the accident, and we'll get you out of here as quickly as possible. Okay, thanks. Yep. Do you think, are you Colorado? Are you from here? I'm from the Midwest originally. Uh -huh. We've been in Florida for five years, and this is our first winter bag. But is everybody okay? My daughter and I are both fine. Right. Both strapped in, airbags went off, we're safe. Good. This is a driver's statement. What I need to do is go ahead and fill out the top part. Uh, and if you think the UK relishes red tape and form filling, the Americans love it too. She'll be ours filling this lot in. Back, sign on back. Stay on the front, sign and date it here. And you said you had your daughter with you? Yeah. Okay, let's go ahead and list her information down there for me. The weather changes very quickly here in Colorado, and this is pretty much the first serious snow we've had, and it always catches people out, especially people from who've moved in from out of state to this area. And that's what's happened here. This lady was going, she said about 60 miles an hour in these conditions, which is far too fast, and that's the result. And what she doesn't know yet is she's going to get a ticket. When we pulled up, you saw the red car down north of us spin out, and that's because they're watching us. People aren't paying attention, they're driving, they're trying to see what I'm doing on the side of the road, and then they spin out and it causes more accidents. So the quicker we can get this investigated, the quicker we can get it done and get it out of here and open up the roadway completely, uh, the safer it will be for everybody else. If you do something wrong whilst you're driving in the States, you might get pulled over by one of up to three different types of policemen. There's the city police, there's the county sheriff, and there's the state trooper. And if you are pulled over, a very important piece of advice, do nothing at all. You know how in the UK we are always told to get out of the car, stand up and talk to the police officer. Here, if you move, it's taken as an act of aggression. And if you get out of the car, you might very quickly find a gun pointed at you. We actually want people to stay in their car, keep their hands on the wheel where we can see them, but actually stay in the car and we'll approach them. That way they're safe, they don't have to worry about getting hit by traffic. The officer it's, feels a little more comfortable, that way they can see what's going on as opposed to having somebody come out of the car and approach them. It comes an officer safety issue also. A lot of times uh, when people don't want to get back in the car because there's something in there that they don't want us to see or smell. So it doesn't happen very often, but it does. Is that worrying? Just get your, uh, your senses going, get 
become a little more aware of all your surroundings. Earlier in the program, I told you I was going to bring you to a fantastic hot rod shop specializing in customization of those big North American cars. This is the place. The building doesn't look like much, but I'll tell you, in these walls, absolute magic happens. Come and see what they do inside here. So I want to introduce you to a man who has specialized in customization and street rodding for about 40, 45 years. And his name is Duke Brown, and he's here right now in the Duke Street Rod Company Workshop. How are you doing, Duke? I'm doing well, thank you very much. Thanks so much for having us in your shop, and I want to hear all about your career and your life and what you do to these wonderful cars. You've got one here, a Chevy engine right there. Mm -hmm. But first of all, a bit of background for our British viewers about you. You're originally from England. Tell us where you're from. Yes, I, uh, I was born 20 miles north of London in Hatfield. Uh -huh. uh, came over here in 1955 with my parents, my yeah. brother, and uh, al already had uh, quite an interest in North American cars. Uh, yeah. My dad had a, an enormous love affair for American cars, and the last vehicle that he owned in England was a 39 Pontiac. Really? Great big boat of a beast that would hardly fit on the little narrow roads over there. Yeah. And then we, uh, we were in the West End part of Toronto and, uh, and met up with a bunch of people our own age. and. Uh, Hmm. Uh, in that part of the city, there was no garages on the front of the buildings. They were all in back laneways around the back wooden garages, and, and uh, all these little old cars seemed to appear from everywhere, and got involved helping people. Really? Yeah. So what do people think about all of these street rods? And when they hear your accent and they hear that you're you know, from England, what, what do they think of Duke Brown when he comes barreling down on these great big huge customized street rods that you've spent two years customizing? I don't think that a lot of people make the connection that I was from England, actually. No? You know, a lot of people think that... Uh, from America, actually, I've spent actually quite a bit of time in the United States mm -hmm. over the years with uh, different things that I've worked at, judging right. at car shows and, and that type of thing. So, Duke, let's suppose I found a car, a dilapidated thing, uh, in the middle of a farmer's field and there's weeds growing through it, that sort of thing, and I say, I've got this car, Duke, I want you to redo. What's the process from start to finish after we haul it here to the shop? Well, first of all, I take a good look at it and, and let you know whether it was actually worthwhile repairing. Mm -hmm. It's very. It's getting increasingly more difficult to find, uh, you know, good good cars with good, good wrecks, sheet metal yeah, now. Yeah. But you can look at them and, and uh, decide whether it is actually savable or not. What uh, are the things? A, what are the? What's the criteria that you work on? Body structure mostly. If if the body sort of rotted up to the hinges, then we stay away from it. I see. Yeah. But uh, you know, anywhere below that, or you know, we think we can save a bunch of stuff. We're going to replace the floors and all all that type of thing anyway. Probably yeah. the firewall. So that's not really a problem. Mm -hmm. Right here, you've got a chassis. That looks like you've done a bit of welding and fabricating there. This is a chassis for a 32 Ford uh, Roadster mm -hmm. that my brother and I are building. Right. Uh, th this is all brand new stuff. It looks a little rusty, oh, but it's it? just okay. been, it's been sitting around. But they're brand new stamped out metal parts. Oh, I see, yeah. And that's mm -hmm. what we'll be using for that project. Right. So then, now, what do you do? Do you concentrate on uh, just the body? When you customize a hot rod, what I'm getting at is, is this an engine we're looking at here? Is that your work polishing that up as a, like a new pin, or is that a crate engine? No, it's not a crate motor. It's a small block Chevy 350 that's been, uh, that's been bored and stroked out to 383. It's what they call a stroker engine. Uh -huh. Actually, the customer, the chap that I'm doing this for, he, he did most of this work himself. He's trying to help a little bit, so he did this. And he bought right. the valve covers that were actually already polished and all right. these little components that bolt on. And what, what is this car? What are we looking at here? It's a 1938 Chev Coupe. Everything has to be inspected, albeit not by a necessarily a specialist, but a licensed mechanic has to inspect a vehicle, mm -hmm. and it has to pass those inspections. If that person thought that the vehicle was not safe to drive on the road, then he wouldn't get the safety certificate. Mm -hmm. Subsequently, the car could not be licensed. What have you done here at the front end with the suspension? Okay, the, the front suspension has been changed. It has uh, all Mustang II components now. Mm -hmm. It has a custom-made cross member with a power rack. Mm -hmm. uh, a chassis, of, of course, was all sandblasted and uh, nicely right. painted. Do you have to, because you're putting such a beefy engine in, what was the, the horsepower on the engine again? This one uh, would be around 300 horsepower. That's a serious yeah. engine, isn't it? Yeah. Show us a little bit about uh, the car at the back and what you've done. Maybe there's a, well, a little the lower, more to learn. The lower portion of the body was, uh, on this particular vehicle, was rotted away, so we replaced the bottoms of the doors and the bottoms of the quarter panels. Mm -hmm. the, fe the fenders, these have been replaced. They're fiberglass items. Right. The firewall had been replaced. All the floor has been replaced all the way through. Can we have a look at the floor here? Yeah, sure. Great. How yeah. do we open that? Okay. I've removed the door handles, obviously. Oh, okay. There's several ways to get into the car. So this will be the finish when the customer takes it home. Exactly. There will not be a door handle. No, no well, door How handle. will you get in this car? Okay, then? the several ways, actually. I, I've uh, developed this way of putting latches on the back portion. You can either open the door with a little catch from really? down below. 
or you'll use a remote control. There are solenoids down inside, uh -huh. and there are handles. And on down a key below. fob, you'll beep. Yeah, and it'll just pop uh, the and latch. It'll pop the latch. That's yes. a great idea. Mm -hmm. So tell me what you've done here. Then is is this your own customization, or are those pans for the floor available on the shelf somewhere? They are available from a company called. Uh, Heck of a name, bitchin' products. Uh, <laughs> but I, I actually made these. I, I prefer to make my own. That way I can make everything fit really well. I find the other ones have to be trimmed anyway, and they're quite mm -hmm. expensive. Mm -hmm. And for a couple of sheets of 18-gauge uh, metal, I can, right. I can fabricate all these, uh, these pieces and save the customer a considerable amount of money. And how many cars have you done in your career, do you think? <laughs> That's probably the most often asked question. Yeah. Heck, I don't, don't know. Don't you write on the door on each one, car number 4021, <laughs> so you remember? In the past, sometimes I've made a little note somewhere on the car, and customers yeah. ask me to write somewhere or sign something for them. Uh, yeah. Uh, one of the a car I did last year, uh, actually a 35 Ford Coupe, yeah. the customer had me uh, sign something in a, in a section of the trunk that he didn't paint over. He just wanted that written in there. Really? No, I don't know. I, it, would be, uh, it would be up. A hundred, more than a yeah. hundred. Aren't you getting a little old though for crawling under cars and bending over and heaving wrenches and that sort of thing? Or uh, time has taken its toll a little bit, but yeah. I'm still still getting around okay. Yeah. Well, no, I, I'm not saying that you you don't look fit. I'm just saying I know that there's people older than myself that say, oh, I'm too old to do the brakes on my car now, or they say, oh, I don't want to climb under there and do that. I'll get the muffler shop to do it. I don't ever want to say that. Yeah. No. Good for you. <laughs>um, our other two trucks are both gas engines, and this is the one that uh, is really going to push the bigger lots that we have. Um, we're able to put a larger plow on it. It's got the engine in the rear end to really do it. Now, in the UK, that's the work of the councils, but it is a private concern here. People just ring you up and out you go and Absolutely. clear their driveways. It's and we're talking about some very interesting kit here. This is just isn't a, pl a blade on the front end of the car. This is fancy stuff. How does it work? Ab Actually, this is an 8-foot Western Pro plow. It's a unimount plow, which means... The plow assembly and the lights are all going to come off the truck so you're not driving around with a light assembly on the truck like the old ones were. It's really a simple operation. you got two pins that are going to hold it onto a permanent hitch on the truck, another two pins that are going to hold the light assembly up. The chain you see here is going to do your up and down. It's just a hydraulic piston, a very simple hydraulic motor that's take transmission fluid or power steering fluid. It's not really a hydraulic motor in a sense. Um, it's going to angle all the way to your left and right, obviously, to keep the snow from pushing one way or another depending on what, what lot you're doing. Why did you pick this particular car? Um, basically, um, the thing that sold us on this one was some of the interior stuff as well as the four doors that actually open, but the big thing was the engine. Um, the Chevys that we've had in the past, we wanted a diesel and really the Ford was the only one that had the power stroke that we read up on a lot and it was the best one in my opinion and my partner's opinion that it was the one that we should buy. Now, in the UK, we don't go for pickups very much, and uh, one of the reasons is that this is open at the back, mm -hmm. and it's not of much use to us. But, I mean, here you get snow, you get terrible weather, just like we do. Absolutely. Why does this work here? The, the bed itself? Yeah. A salting service like we do, if, unfortunately, we don't have one on this truck, but there's basically a unit that's going to mount on the back of this that's going to salt a lot. You see some of the salt already on this parking lot. It's going to allow you to put a, a pallet of salt or any other shovels or any other type of tools you need in the back of this truck. So a pickup truck by far is the only thing that we could use in our business to work. The interior, I, I like it a lot. The four doors is, you can see the room you have in there. Um, there's lumbar seats as well as power seats. There's power everything, CD player, um, power mirrors. It's basically loaded with everything you could possibly get on a, a truck like this being the XLT series. Take me for driving it, would you? Sure. All right, great. Well, you've got to remember, presumably, to, to raise the blade if you're exactly. traveling. Exactly. Like, <laughs> basically, you're just going to have your on and off. That red light's going to show you if it's on or off. Uh -huh. um, just an easy push up. It's going to raise your blade uh -huh. to the height where you can... Trundle around. The right or left, you're going to see the blade move right or left. 
It's got a 7.3 liter Ford Power Stroke diesel. Um, it's basically gonna put any other diesel out right now to shame, as well as any gas engine out. The rear end can can pull any trailer that you could possibly. Basically when you're plowing, you just angle the blade and push the snow whatever direction you want to clear. Yeah, yeah. And it doesn't, can you feel much resistance? I mean, is this? Not at all. Now that's a proper job, isn't it? Brett Deweese, landscape gardener and snow plough operator. Doesn't get more butch than that. What am I? Television presenter. It doesn't work really, is it? So Duke, what have you got in here then? Well, we've got quite a mixture actually. Look Cars from the from the 20s actually to the uh, to the 50s. What's this one here? It's going to be a hot rod, is it? 29 Ford, yeah. It's going to be a little uh, a nostalgia uh, style hot rod. He's right. going to use a lot of older parts, which is uh, a lot of people are doing that now, you know, trying yeah. to create that old look. Really? It'll be fantastic. a neat little car when it's done. So he's just uh, got it down to the cockpit now and mm -hmm. all the other parts are somewhere just else. Just purchased it, actually, yeah. This is like one of those. Uh, yeah. You know, the kind of a car that mm -hmm. almost sort of got dug out of a field, that type of thing we were right? talking about earlier. Yeah. through, yeah. yeah that and this one here, this is nice. This is a 55 uh, Ford pickup truck. Right. Uh, it has a big block Chevy, 454 Chevy motor. Right. Oh, another one of uh, independent front suspension from a Mustang II, which right. we were talking about earlier. It doesn't sound heavy enough for something like this, but they actually work quite well. Really? Beefed up suspension. Good yeah. stuff. Nine and inch Ford rear end. Th will this be, uh, be we'll a... We'll have a pickup box, box, box on the back, the back. yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. Yeah. Now this one here, what's this one? This is a 47 Pontiac. Pontiac, right. Yeah. Very nice. Also, look uh, at the chrome on it. That's one of the be younger chap, One of the younger chaps in the car club owns this, and he's a, he's a bit of a brute for power, so he's going to put a powerful engine in it. Uh-huh. Likes to drive fast. Very good. So they're doing some grinding now. This has been previously owned, I guess. Yes. And, well, obviously previously owned, but I mean, it's, it, it's been it, refinished it was, once it already. Was, it was a street rod at one time, yes. Right. And so, he's recently purchased it, and he's just he's doing it in the style that he would like to have it now. He's removed some chrome. Right. As you can see, and uh, yeah, and he's grinding away. Yeah, it's beautiful. I like the red. Repairing some red. areas underneath. I think it's going to be flat black when it gets oh, finished. Oh, is it? And he, right. Once again, in in that theme of a nostalgia mm -hmm. type vehicle. Right. And, yeah. What's behind yeah. us here then? Okay, well, 57 Chev uh, sedan delivery, and this uh, uh, fella, he's putting new floors in here. You know, uh -huh. resurrecting it, so to speak. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bringing it back to life. Exactly. As they all are. That's right. Wonderful. You guys are doing some great work in the mm -hmm. members here. What have you got? How many members are in the club? 19. Only 19? Yes. So it's a nice, close, comfortable group. Absolutely, yeah. We all try to get along. And how does that work? Everybody gets along so far? Yep. That's good. And mm -hmm. you guys have been around for a long time. How long? Since 1956. Wow. So what's the general principle behind the club then? It's a club where people can share tools, share knowledge? Absolutely. We started out with five members down in the Parkdale area of Toronto. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, and it's evolved into what it is today. We moved into this facility in 1959. Right. And yeah, we purchased tools that uh, the members can use. They help one another. We have licensed mechanics in the car club mm -hmm. that make sure that every vehicle that it, that's going to go out of here is, is uh, built safely and uh, uh, constructed safely. So it will pass so, the certification. Absolutely, right. yes. Yeah, we have a uh, room back here is where we, what we, call, we, we do the finishing. Yeah, there's none of the dirt, although it looks kind of messy, none of the Jesus dirty work is done. Murphy. It's just, just final assembly. And next to us we have? Well, a little Chevy too. Okay. Uh, I don't know, it's in for some few repairs. He's not going to do an enormous amount of work on it, I don't believe. It. It's a nice little car. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And now there's one there in jet black that looks like it's almost okay, ready for a, the road. Yeah, we got... Uh, Packages and stuff. Henry's yeah. vehicle here, the 30... Hey, Henry, 30, how are you? Adrian Bell. We met again. 30, yeah. 35, 35 Ford Coupe. You might want to ask Henry some stuff about it. Or... What's the quick story behind <laughs> this one, Henry? No, there's a story, but uh, it's, not a, it's not a short story. It's, oh, uh, okay. it's a story started three and a half years ago. Is that right? And again, when I was much, much younger and had a full head of black hair. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so if you could put a dollar figure on how much you've put in so far, how much is it? Uh, the way this car sits now, we're $60,000 into it. And what did you buy it for when it was in the condition um, that you found it? We picked it up, um, $8,500. That was uh, right. just a body and a rusty old frame. Right. And what vehicle is it? What, what model? It's a 1935 Ford three-window coupe. My God. That's a long time ago, isn't it? So what engine have you put in? This is the 350, uh, V8 350. Mm -hmm. it's, uh, it's a stroker motor. The stroke of the motor, the stroke of the piston has been, uh, has, has been lengthened. Uh, right. It ups the horsepower, basically. I see. Okay. It's, uh, 
It's pretty high tech. It's got uh, roller rockers, Evans roller in it. And what's this one tucked over in the corner, Duke? Okay, it's a 1937 Pontiac. Another Pontiac, wow. Yes. Although you can't see the motor, it has a, a sort of a, a, a tune port, small block Chevy engine. Uh -huh. What's the fascination with black paint on custom <laughs> cars? Black is beautiful. Is that right? <laughs> or is it? Uh, and once a you, black, have a, once black, you have a black car, you'll never go back. Black cars look uh, prettier in the shade. Oh, right. Very good. Say, yeah. Very good. Terribly hard to keep clean, though. That's a famous song by Gino Vanelli, actually, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Black cars look better in the shade. Yeah. Duke, I understand you have a meeting room where you do all the company business. Yes, come this way. Uh, show you upstairs. We meet once every two weeks. Mm -hmm. up these creaky old stairs, Adrian. They're uh, they're well worn. Yeah. Actually, we rent them out to uh, horror movies. Yeah, right. Just, just, yeah. a, just a joke. Something under the stairs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this is just where you do all of your uh, company business, is it? Well, this is where the, the car club. They store all their right. parts. Sure. Uh, and here we go. This is our club room. Wonderful. We meet here once every two weeks, uh -huh. or if we have any special meetings, executive meetings, or anything, we would meet here. Yeah, it's nice and cozy. We'll make all the, uh, the really important billiards. decisions. Sure. And the There's, bartender's uh, not on duty today. Why is that? No, he's not. <laughs> oh, it's a Sunday. I guess that's why. So tell me a, a little bit about the uh, differences between Britain and America in terms of customization. It would appear to me that uh, there's not a lot of difference between what's going on in, in Britain and in North America. So there we are have, there are large pockets of enthusiasts in England. Oh yeah, no, and right through Europe. Yes, I didn't absolutely. Know that. Yes. Wow, yeah. it's been a thrill to see what you do here and uh, meet you, Duke. And I want to thank you so much, and especially for comparing for us the whole idea of bonnets and hoods and how things work there and here. It's been a pleasure seeing what you do, and I want to thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. My pleasure.